Kelly Steele, and for being creative, that's what we're going to talk about today. First, you figure out what's worth stealing. Then you move on to the next thing. Austin Kleon, Steal Like an Artist. Today, we're going to talk about the book, Steal Like an Artist, 10 Things Nobody Told You About Being Creative by Austin Kleon. Many people have recommended this book to me personally and on podcasts I listen to, people talked about how much this book changed their thinking. I've been excited to read all about it. And he says that this book for him is autobiographical, that he learned in the process of becoming creative all the things that are in this book. And he says this implies to anyone who's trying to get some creativity, their life, their work. And then he says, quote, in other words, this book is for you, whoever you are, whatever you make. Let's get started. We all rest, what they say, on the shoulders of giants. None of us are going to invent something entirely new. I mean, even this podcast, I talk about a book I read. I'm not writing a book. Maybe someday I will. But I talk about other people's books and how that book led me to a certain line of thinking. And so he said, in the end, is an idea worth stealing? And if the answer is no, move on to the next thing. And if the idea is yes, still move on to the next thing. We're going to keep going and going through that process over and over again. And it's not about worrying about what's good or bad. He says there's only stuff worth stealing and stuff that is not worth stealing. And he says that everything is available to us. And in fact, you know, he probably would appreciate this podcast. Not that I'm stealing his book, but I'm talking about his book and in the end, taking his ideas and running with them. Hopefully you're running with these ideas too. He says it says it right in the Bible in Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. And there really isn't. When you look at music or you look at plays or you look at movies, sometimes you watch a movie and you think, isn't this like that Greek play? And maybe someone will say that, that, you know, I read this Greek play and I decided to modernize it. But sometimes they don't because you think about every genre of movie. There's love stories and there's mysteries and there's this and there's that. And all of them, whether they started out as books or went to plays or started out as movies or became songs, concepts are similar. In fact, they're probably all like country music with a truck and a girl and a dog and someone gets left. And he said, you can look at this, you know, I think, in a depressing way to say, I'll never come up with anything original. I thought that when I was in high school science, I wanted to invent something. And then I was like talking to my dad and I said, you know, it feels like everything's been invented already. I don't think there's anything left to invent. Well, guess what? We figured out a whole bunch of brand new things to invent. It's not true, but we take what people have done and we step on their shoulders and build something better from that. We make it original. We make it something new. And if we can just get over this idea of doing that is a bad thing or doing that is not creative or not original and instead decide to advance whatever's being done, we'll make great things out of it. And he says that our job is to, quote, collect good ideas. The more good ideas you collect, the more you can choose from what you're going to be influenced by. So if you look at great art, if you look at great poetry, if you listen to good podcasts, I tried to base this podcast on podcasts I liked and some podcasts I didn't like. So some of it was not stealing from something I like. Some of it was going, hmm, I don't enjoy this anymore. I want to go in a podcast that goes in a different direction. So I think sometimes stealing is almost the anti-stealing too. And he says that it's good, you know, to collect all these things and put them in a file somewhere. I know that I have collected graphic art for a long time. Someday I want to learn how to draw. So I collected this digital folder filled with pictures that I thought I could draw. Easy enough, but really beautiful and something I could start with so that when I started learning to draw, I could use some of those pieces of art, those pieces of graphics as inspiration. Same thing when I find a good sentence. I read a book. I think it was called The Historian. And it was about a woman who's on the heels of trying to investigate this vampire story. And I wasn't that enthralled by the book, to be honest with you. Her writing was so beautiful. It was like one of the first times I really looked at a book and go, wow, she 
wrote this thing about this woman walking down a flight of stairs and instantaneously you just knew 40 things just happened based on this one sentence. It was an amazingly well-crafted sentence. So I saved the sentence because I thought someday if I ever write something, I want to be like that. I want to be able to take a sentence and turn it into something that meaningful. If you collect all these good ideas, things that are inspirations to you, ways you like to think of the world, art that inspires you to go further, something like that, and you collect them in a place that you can refer to them, they can inspire you for a long time. And you can make a lifetime effort of just collecting things you love, things that bring you to a higher level in whatever it is you're trying to do. And he says that you should see yourself as part of this creative family, one member in the tree of family people who create great things. He created this image of his family tree, of his creativity. He says they feel like friendly ghosts to him, like a family. And when he's stuck or when he's, I don't know, burned out, he talked about being hunched over his desk, he can see his inspiration, what it is that he comes from. And so he said that school, you're supposed to school yourself. He says, quote, school is one thing, education is another. The two don't always overlap. What? And I've always believed that. School was there to teach you how to learn something, teach you how to research something, how to organize your thoughts in a way that made sense to other people. Organize your thoughts so that you could write them, so that you could paint them, so that math and science made sense to you. That was just the beginning point. This is supposed to be a lifetime of learning, a lifetime of figuring out what to do. And your curiosity about the world, he says, we should be curious about all the things around us. He says, look things up, ask questions. I think that's really in the basis of me and my friend Adam. We're doing a blog, a better life in small steps.com. The one thing that brings us together as friends, because we're quite opposite in many different ways type A versus type B, good writer versus talking person. I could go on and on about all the differences, but the one thing we have together is that sense of curiosity, is that ability and that desire to look things up. We went hiking out in the woods in winter. We had never gone before. We thought maybe it's fun to go hiking in the winter. So we went to our favorite county park and there's a lake at the park and it was suddenly making this very strange creaking noise. We write it down, went back home and looked it up. Why is that lake creaking like that? We always are looking up to see what the answer to something is. Why is it like that? Does that bird swim? Does it only fly? Does this do that or this? Or why is this town called this name? We should find out why. He's saying that. Always look things up. Always educate yourself. There's something magic in almost all the stories that are just around us. And he says that you should always be reading, going in the library, getting surrounded by all sorts of articles and lost in the library. That's the other thing that brings me and my friend together. We had both worked in libraries since we were little kids in other towns. So we both came up through this entire education of the library world and met each other became friends, and then we ended up working at the library in college together. We've been friends a long time, and libraries have been a big point for the both of us. He says then you can collect books and collect articles and just keep a file. All the things he says you swipe from other people, put them in a file. Or you can just take pictures and have images, you know, whatever you like to do. And he says that there's this gap of what we want versus what we are today. And that learning that creativity can help us bridge that gap. But we're going to have to learn every day. So he talks a little bit about the fake it till you make it thing. I have always hated that phrase, I have to tell you. I've just never believed in faking it. And I guess it irked me in a sense because I would go to work and I was very much a person who was honest about what I was good at and honest what I was bad at. And so then this project would come up and they say, well, Jill, do you know how to do X, Y, and Z? And I say, well, I know how to do X and Y, but I'm pretty sure that I could research on Z and get there. Then someone who had been in the company half the time I'd been there would say, oh yeah, I know all about it. Do you? I don't think you do because I know that I know X and Y better than you do. And I'm pretty sure you know nothing about Z. 
because that person said yes, and I was more honest about the situation. They got the projects, they got the promotions, and it felt like lying because they really just said yes every single time, regardless of what it was. So that phrase kind of is a thorn in my side. He takes the phrases two different ways. First, pretend to be something that you're not until you're successful at it, until everyone can see that you're successful at it. And then the other way you can take it is just pretend to be making something until you actually make it. I don't know. Like I said, I don't like that phrase, but he said either way, you're going to dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So you're going to start doing the work you want to get, not the work you're already doing. And so I think that's what he's saying about these projects. When those people said yes, they were already putting on the clothes of that person who could do Z. And I was just being honest and saying, no, I don't know anything about Z, but I could learn it if I wanted to. Okay. So then he gives a quote from Yohiji Yahamoto, and it said, start copying what you love. Copy, copy, copy. At the end of the copy, you'll find yourself. I think even if you're copying a style or copying something that you love doing. If I were to take a podcast and I say, I'm going to do this in the style of this other podcast because I love this other podcast, eventually it becomes my own. Eventually I take off on it and it becomes what I want to do. He brings up the idea that the Beatles started out as cover band. They would emulate Buddy Holly and Little Richard and all the songwriters they liked. And eventually they figured out their own style. He says, first of all, you're going to have to figure out who to copy and then you'll figure out what to copy. The copying part, he says, is easy. Copying your hero, copying people that you love, that inspire you, that thrill you, music you like, poems you like, writing you like. You can't just steal the style. He says you want to steal the thinking behind it. You just don't want to look like your hero. You want to see like your heroes. You want to be able to see through their eyes. It's not just enough. And I think he's right on that. If you were to have a music style or a writing style, and you just copied what that person did. Well, heck, ChatGPT can do that. But to really understand and walk in that person's shoes and see through their eyeballs, it's harder to do. You want to get into the mind of the person who's doing it. Why does this person do it this way? Why does this person twist a sentence that way? That's why one of my favorite genres of books are almost books about why someone does the thing that they do. Even Stephen King wrote a book about writing and why he writes the way he does. And I know Stephen King's not everyone's thing, but getting into the brain of Stephen King on how he likes to write, that was valuable. There's all sorts of books like that that help you see in the eyes of somebody else. He gives a quote from Francis Ford Coppola. He says, we want you to take from us. We want you at first to steal from us. Because you can't steal. You will take what we give you. You will put it in your own voice. And that's how you'll find your own voice. And that's how you begin. Someday, someone will steal from you. The idea is when we see all these people who do something in a certain way and we appreciate it, even if you're a movie maker, something very visible in the creative world, they will take something, internalize it, and then churn out something else. And then someday someone's going to steal that same idea from them. I think that's how it's going to go. Someday you break away from that, from what you stole, from how you're seeing the world, from the eyes you're looking through. Now you're doing your own thing. He says good theft is honoring what you're stealing, studying it, and stealing from many people, giving them credit, transforming what they do into something new and remixing it, right? You're going to turn it into something that's very U-shaped. But bad theft is degrading. It just skims. It doesn't do a deep dive into what that person does. Then you just steal from one person. Now you're just trying to be a copy of that person. You plagiarize. You're not giving credit to it. You imitate it and then completely rip it off. That is bad stealing. You want to transform your view into that person kind of take out the gist of what you're learning and make it internal to yourself. I feel too, even with this podcast, I hope that's what I'm doing. I read a book, I internalize it, and then I try to tell you about the book through my own eyes. I am not reading you the book. I am not rewriting the book. I am, I guess, ingesting it 
and forming my own opinions from that book. And I hope in the end I'm honoring what he says. I think I am. He says it's also good when you're looking at your heroes to see what it is you fall short on. I know a lot of times when I see people who I admire in the podcasting world, they're good writers. I know that it is a struggle for me to write. It's not my thing. I'm, again, a talker. So then I realize this is a shortcoming. So either I can decide, I think, at this point that I'm going to take off in a different direction that causes more talking. Maybe I'm going to come up with four podcasts and I'm all talking all the time. Or I'm going to work on the thing I'm not very good at and try to get better at it or try to find my own style at it. But either way, you're not trying to become a twin of that person. You're transforming it into something that you are. I don't know the essence of who you are. And that's what's going to make it good and original. And I think in the end, that's why when people worry about AI and worry about, oh, it taking jobs or it replacing people, it can't do that. It can't transform a piece of work into something completely new, something that's original and from the heart. I think that takes a real person to do. And so I think real writers, Real content creators, real podcasters are always going to be something that's wanted. And I thought this was kind of interesting. It says to write the book you want to read, not the book that you think other people would want to read. Or, you know, they always say, write what you know. But instead, write what you're going to like to do. Write a book that you would like to see. And I hope that, you know, too, in this podcast, that's what I try to do. I'm trying to create a podcast I would like to listen to. Again, a lot of my podcasting came out of frustration I heard from other people. I got tired of all the different interviews, so I'm going to go on your podcast, and you're going to come on my podcast, and we're going to get Bob to come on my podcast and your podcast, and it started feeling like all the same. Also, it means that they can't disagree, because now you're on my podcast. Well, I'm not going to sit there and tell you I don't like your book when you're on my podcast, and I got tired of it. I I got tired of lots of things. And so this podcast is really a reaction of me making a podcast I would like to listen to. So it made me feel like I'm on the right path with this podcast and the other podcasts too. Talks a little bit about computers, about how in this digital age, we forget that this tactile feeling of our hands doing something is important. And I will be the first to tell you there is nothing I do outside of a computer. Everything I do is computer involved, my drawing, what I'm trying to learn how to draw on my iPad, my writing on a computer. But he says there's something about touching something, about printing something out, about feeling the piece of paper, about turning the book page. Is there something that when we involve our body into a project, it makes that project better? It makes it more creative. Understand where he's coming from. And I know I have read that from almost every book that ever mentions it. It's just not going to work for me because I cannot read my own handwriting. I cannot draw a straight line. I cannot cut a piece of paper in a straight line. I am just the world's clumsiest human being. So it's just not going to work for me. But I understand where he's going. And I think that if you have that ability to draw, to sketch, to do things on paper, to do things in a notebook, and that makes you feel something more, absolutely go do that. So we're going to go ahead and end the podcast here. We're going to talk about this book again next week and finish up talking about Steal Like an Artist. I found this book really inspirational, and we'll talk a little bit more about other inspirations that I found from this book. And I hope you will like it too. I hope that it opens up a side for you of how you can express yourself better. Maybe you felt bad, like I've always felt bad, that if I read a book, I can't use it to help me write a book because that's stealing. And what he's saying, that's not true. As long as I follow his good rules and I transform it, I ingest it and it comes out me, I think that's a good kind of stealing. So my challenge to you is try to think of a couple of people you just love in a creative way you would like to go into. If you are someone who loves music, Find a couple of musical people that really inspire you and write down five things about them that you would love to emulate in your own creative task. Again, like whether it's music, it's book writing, it's something else. And figure out what it is you like about those people and come up with a list of five reasons 
why they inspire you and see if you can't start emulating those things. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please tell a friend about the podcast. I would love to expand how many people listen to this podcast. It is my dream someday of having a community of everyone in all my podcasts talking about great ways of making your life better, happier, more fulfilling. And remember, your path to creating that next great thing starts with small steps. 